Beak and I shall be heard. Good morning, New York. Namaste. This is Alex Bennett uh, coming at you with... Uh, how, many, how, many, how many watts of power do we have? 15,000? How many we have? Is that our ERP? Effective radiated power? I don't know. <clears throat> have to check that out. Anyway. What it is, folks, is a hamster. A little... Uh, a little treadmill and uh, he supplies our power to us um, I don't know about you but I am at my wits end today how many of you out there are feeling hot I don't know what it is no I know what it is just the way things are. But every time there is a heat like this, the air conditioning in my building breaks. We have central air conditioning, and it seems that every time, <clears throat> every time there's this kind of heat wave, it breaks down. So my apartment today, which is not meant to live in without air conditioning, because they, they don't... Uh, have a situation where you can open up a lot of windows and get a good draft going. <coughs> we can start another war and get a good draft going. But um, it, um, it was just absolutely excruciating. So I took some time out, went over to see a friend tonight whose air conditioner was working. But the only part of it is, is that even if your air conditioner was working, most of them can't handle this heat. They cannot cool down an apartment in this heat. Air conditioning has been restored to my apartment, and it's still warm in there. So I came up here. It's kind of cool here, although it is still a little warm here, actually. Do you think they could send up more ice or something like that? Are they, are they, are they just about sending up as much air conditioning as it's possible to send up today tonight? Oh, they aren't sending up as much as possible. Let's call down to them and tell them to send more up. I want it freezing in here, man. I want to be able to hang meat. I want to be able to see my breath. It is absolutely excruciating. Now, I don't normally open up the show with a record, but uh, I figure you're all, many of you are lying out there without air conditioning in your apartment by yourself or with someone else sweating up a storm. I mean, tonight was the night, instead of putting sheets on your bed, you put towels down, right? and they'll be ringing wet by morning. And I've always felt that this particular recording, more than any other, best captured New York City on a hot, sultry night like tonight. Take it. As I always do tonight, just, just a little something silly to open up the show. Well, not silly, really. Uh, you don't have to clear the calls on this. I'm just going to answer the phones. Just dial me at 541-4690. What I want are your suggestions on how one can cool oneself down on an evening like tonight. Yeah, anybody have any suggestions? In fact, I'd like to know how various people out there listening right now are cooling them, keeping themselves cool. Uh, if you have a way of keeping yourself cool, we would like to know because it is it is devastating out there. Um, so let me just just ring and I'll pick up here. And uh, don't try and get wise because we, of course, can take care of any obscenities that would be. Uh, if that's what you were thinking of, I mean, don't waste your money. Uh, hello, have you got a way of keeping cool? Uh, yes, I do, Alex. What's that? Uh, you take uh, hot water. That, and it's probably going to sound crazy, but uh, see, like they usually say, uh, you know, if you feel cold, use cold water. Uh, use cold water. If you feel hot, use hot water. Because you take the hot water and you, you know, you rub it all down yourself and all that. And um, and actually, like if you have an air conditioner, and now you're probably going to say that this is crazy, but you'd be surprised unless if you're prone to pneumonia or something like that. I'm, I'm not goofing or anything. And you just sit in front of an air conditioner or, or a fan or something, and you'd be surprised how the hot water cools you off. You see, because when cold water hits you in your heart, it's going to get warm. And when you put hot water on you, that cools off, hmm. in other words. Doesn't make much sense to me, but if it keeps you cool, great. Uh, or actually, you could just uh, sit in front of a fan, that's all. I mean, uh, you know, even though it gives off hot air. Right. Well, so do I. But yeah. well, Th Thank you for calling. Uh, Bye-bye. How, how are you keeping cool? Are you there? Hello? Hello? 
Alex. Yeah, how are you keeping cool? I sit in a furnace. You sit in a furnace? Yes. Hot stuff. How do you keep cool? I don't know. How do you keep cool? How do you keep cool? Yeah, Alex, uh, I'm at work right now. Mm -hmm. And I have the air, I found the key to my boss's office. I had the air conditioner turned up full. And it's like a tornado of cool air. It's making the windows steam and everything. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Right. How are you keeping cool? How are you keeping cool? Going streaking. Going streaking. That was last year's fad. Somebody ought to tell him. Well, how are you keeping cool? Oh, I just kind of fell out of love. It kind of chills things off. You fell out of love, so it kind of chills things off. Uh, how are you keeping cool? Oh, I've been sitting in a nice cold tub all night, and I just got out, and I heard you were sitting there talking about it, so I figured I'd call you and tell you. Did the cool tub cool you down? Eh. It's getting hot again, right? Not bad. Back in the it tub, so you turn into a prune. What are you doing to keep cool? You lie on a bare floor in, uh, in complete nudity. You and, uh, you'd be surprised, Al. Yeah, but I, mean, I would imagine it would have to be like a rugless floor, something that would uh, uh, attain some kind of uh, coldness, because a, a rug wouldn't do that, right? Oh, that's what I said. I said a bare floor, meaning like linoleum or... Maybe a bathroom floor, for instance, with tile. Yeah, stuff. right, something like that. And then also, you could put, if you have a window fan, it says in and out on it. You keep your bedroom window open, put it in, put it in your living room window on out, mm -hmm. close all the other windows, and you'd be surprised that to put on out and act as an exhaust fan. You know, mm -hmm. and then all the cool air comes into the bedroom window. It like you know goes around the bed. <clears throat> it's like scientific, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, and you'd be surprised. Just put it on mm -hmm. out. It gets all the hot air out of the house, mm -hmm. and it comes around. It goes into your bedroom window. Okay, thank you. Okay. How do you beat the heat? I soak my head in the toilet. Hmm. You really ought to. Uh, how do you uh, How do you beat the heat? I find a frigid woman and she cools me off. I see. How do you uh, beat the heat? I you beat the heat. Yes, huh? Mm -hmm. I, well, I'm just sitting in front of my fan, and I'm still warm as warm as uh, the underworld, but I'm dry as a bone. Yeah, I think it's the humidity that really bothers most of us. I mean, I don't mind heat. I just mind sweating. Yeah, so I'm sitting here. I'm very, very hot, but I'm dry as a bone, and that's what really yeah. that's what I like to get rid of. Right. Thank you. Okay. What are you doing to keep cool? I smoke dope. Happy birthday, Jerry Garcia. <laughs> What are you doing uh, to keep cool? I've taken up residence on the top shelf of my refrigerator. <laughs> what are you doing to keep cool? Uh, you know what you do? What? Go in the uh, bathroom. You don't mind sitting in the bathtub for a while. You get all the ice cubes from the ice box and just dump it in with cold water and just sit there for hours. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, but you also might catch pneumonia that way, and if you're prone to heart attacks, you might get a heart attack from well, it. Well, if you don't, you're prone to heart attacks, don't do it. But if you want to keep cool, try it. Okay. All right. I wouldn't suggest it, folks. Uh, well, I can tell you a story later, but uh, the people have been known to die from being thrown into bathtubs full of ice cubes. Good morning. How are you keeping cool? Hi, Alex. I do something similar to that lady who, um, uh, I opened the window, the upper portion of a window mm -hmm. in one room. In the other room, I um, opened the bottom portion with the fan, you know, taking mm -hmm. the, uh, the heat in the upper window. Mm -hmm. And I also opened, uh, turned on the shower, cold shower, and you'd be surprised, it, uh, a lot of... A uh, breeze comes out from the shower. It mm -hmm. cools the house quite a bit, although my house has rugs all over it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, take care. I'll take one more here. What do you do to keep cool? I um, I sleep on the floor, and you know, like on a sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. But instead, I take like the sleeping bag from under me, and like I just let myself sleep. And you should be, you'd be surprised on how my door keeps cool. How's that? She 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 calls herself around the toilet bowl. She what? Curls herself around the toilet bowl. Yeah, around the back. Right. Sure. Water. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> what are you doing curl around that toilet bowl? Well, it's cool here. No, I yeah, you're right. It's a good place. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, some interesting ways that people are beating the heat in this <clears throat> very oppressive weather that we're facing here in New York City. Here's a public service message from WPLJ. The Consumer Product Safety Commission needs your help, and if you're one of 20 million Americans hurt every year... <clears throat> He said, clearing his throat, in product-related accidents, call the commission's toll-free number. The number is 800-638-2666. Consumer product safety. People make it happen. And uh, people are what make news. And to relate that to us, the one and only Rick James.
The FBI has now joined the search for former Teamsters President Jimmy Hoffa missing since Wednesday. In Detroit during the day, two Hoffa aides underwent hypnosis after they couldn't recall whom Hoffa was scheduled to meet Wednesday at the lunch hour. Under hypnosis, they came up with some names, as ABC's Jerry Stanicky reports from Detroit. Unimpeachable sources here in Detroit tell me James Hoffa went to meet with two, possibly three people. The meet was with Tony Provazino. Tony Pro, he's called. He's a refuted mafia figure from the East Coast and former Teamster vice president. The other man, Lenny Schultz, an alleged underworld figure here in Detroit under investigation for the alleged murder of a furniture executive with reported mob ties. Tony Giacalone, the man who reportedly set up the meet, didn't show. Hoffa disappeared Wednesday afternoon after calling his wife around 2.30. The family tells me there has been absolutely no contact from anyone about James R. Hoffa. Jerry Stanicky, ABC News, Detroit. An FBI spokesman admitted Saturday night that the Bureau for 20 years had a secret list of about 15,000 Americans who were to be detained in the event of a national emergency. The spokesman said the list was kept until 1971 when Congress repealed the detention provisions of the International Security Act of 1950. However, this morning's New York Times says the list is still being maintained by the FBI Domestic Intelligence Division. The list is said to include the names of Communist Party members and others who the FBI thought might commit sabotage or espionage. President Ford is spending the night in Bucharest and will fly to Belgrade and Yugoslavia later today. That will be Mr. Ford's final stop on the five-nation tour of Europe that began nine days ago. President Ford and Tito will reaffirm the principles of cooperation based on a 1971 agreement when Tito visited former President Nixon in Washington. Meanwhile, Japanese Premier McKee has arrived in the United States, headed for meetings with Mr. Ford in Washington later this week. McKee says he wants to expand trade further between the U.S. and Japan, especially getting more lumber imports for his nation. The two leaders are also expected to talk about oil and the instability in Asia following the Indochina Wars. Alabama Governor George Wallace has resumed presidential campaigning outside his home state for the first time since suffering a broken leg. Wallace was greeted warmly at a picnic in Fancy Farm, Kentucky, as he spoke out against Eastern ultra-liberals. But Wallace was momentarily stunned when a flashbulb exploded with a pop as one photographer took his picture. It was a sound not unlike the gunshot that felled Wallace on the campaign trail nearly four years ago. And here's how it sounded. Yes, I feel that government in the last number of years That photographer took another picture again. The flashbulb went off with a loud pop, and the photographer was booed and asked to leave by others in the crowd at Fancy Farm, Kentucky. People here in the Northeast spent most of Saturday trying to find ways to beat the heat. Temperatures were in the upper 90s here in New York City, even higher, over 100 in Connecticut and other spots. Even normally cool Nantucket Cove was blistering, and Nantucket policeman Dennis Sullen says the heat emptied the streets. Beaches were all crowded. Uh, the streets uh, seemed to be less uh, numerous amount of people on the streets. It seemed that all of them were out taking a dip in the ocean or underneath some sprinklers to avoid all the humidity as it was around 100 degrees here, which is, usually, is very unusual this time of year. Scientists expect the Oroville, California Dam area to suffer aftershocks for the next few days following a recent series of earthquakes. Three moderate-sized quakes at a 300-mile stretch of California again Saturday. A lot of hunt records, right? And the only one I could think of was Heat Wave by Martha and the Vandellas, and I can't find it around here. But that's, uh, <clears throat> it's hot. Um, it's, it's Beach Boys weather. Uh, anyway, uh, we don't want to find out how to cool down. That was just a little opening bit, folks. But now we want to find out what's on your mind about things that are going on in our city and in our world and things that are bothering you, perhaps, as a citizen of uh, the biggest bankrupt city in the world. Um, so let's see what's on your minds this morning. Hello. Hello. Yes. Alex Bennett. Who else did you expect? Moth on the Vandellas. Oh. Good morning. You're on the air. I was wondering what your opinion is, please, on, uh, and I'll tell you what I think, is on, uh, like, when a man rapes a woman, you know, and she gets convicted and everything, what is your opinion on them giving him a, a vasectomy? I think he should get it. Well, a vasectomy isn't going to stop his sex surge. Well, well, that's true, but at least uh, he won't be able to, uh, if it's a case he gets married or something like that, if he wants kids, 
You know, it'll, uh... I don't believe in mutilation under any circumstances. Well, it's not really mutilation. It is mutilation. When you do it's something... A girl. When you do... No, you are molesting... <laughs> you are molesting a woman, and you are committing violence upon a woman, but you are not mutilating them. But, when, but how is, uh, how is vasectomy mutilation? I mean, it's... It's mutilation. Anytime you take a person's body, and you do something to it by cutting it, in one way or another, that is mutilation. No, actually, this is mutilation. That's when you just, uh, how would you say, like, uh, could be anything from chopping up a person to, uh, I thought to a vasectomy. It would be considered mutilation, especially if the person didn't want the vasectomy. It wouldn't be mutilation, uh, perhaps, if he, you know, if he, if he wanted it, but if it was against his will, it would be mutilation. But then in the meantime, why is he raping them? Well, I can't see any reason to give him a vasectomy. Now, some people have suggested castration. Well, that too. I mean, you could have that done. Well, I'm against that, but not for any masculine reasons, because I don't believe in mutilation. Yeah, but then it'll it'll show the guy that, um, I mean, I know it may not stop his, uh, his wanting to rape people, but uh, it would certainly... Uh, well, I'm not a, I'm not a man. Well, a person who rapes other people should have his head examined. Yeah. Not his body, not his body axed. Yeah, but after he has his, his head examined, he, he, he should be put into a position where he can't use the body anymore or something like that. You know. I think, your, I, I think your concept is sick, actually. Why? Why do you think so? I think it's just as sick as a rapist wanting to rape somebody. Yeah, but why do you say something like that? I mean, because I'm saying it, because I think it's a sick concept. Well, what would you think would be a proper punishment to stop a rape? I mean, uh, because you, by using your theory, then we, whenever we find a pickpocket, we should cut his hands off. No, 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 no. Well, oh, wait, wait a moment. Yeah. Come on, you're using the same, the same exact uh, attitude. I mean, pickpocket. You cut a pickpocket's hands off. He's never going to pick a pocket again, is he? Like a physical thing, where he's really going to grab you, and he, all he does is pick the pocket. He, he takes what's in the pocket. He doesn't. He doesn't give you. Yeah, well, but I'm saying that if you believe mutilation is a way of solving crimes, and that's the way we ought to do it. No, I didn't say in solving crime in general. I just said in the sense of a rapist. Well, it's not going to. It's not going to stop. A lot of times, rapists are people who have a, a hate for women. Rapists are people who um, um, feel an urge to hurt women, and 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 rape is certainly a violent act. It's it's it, it, to me it comes under assault in my book, and uh, uh, nothing's going to stop him from beating up women, for instance. Well, sure, in a case like that. All right. But so. uh, but in a case like a vasectomy, I mean, uh, well, at least if. Well, I mean, it's not right to say, but if he did rape another woman, at least she would not be about getting pregnant or anything. Well, what about women who who rape men? Oh, very rarely do you get that. Well, no, no, I disagree. You see, I totally disagree. Well, I think a woman rapes a man. This is great. This is this great myth that men can't be raped, and that's uh, wrong. I mean, they could be raped, but but what do they have to lose? They have nothing to lose. It's the woman that would be risking getting pregnant. Or well, the, of course, she has uh, options available to her in this day and age too. But, I mean, it, it, you know, why do we always consider the violation of women so atrocious, but yet when men are violated by women, and they are, because I have been. You were raped by a woman? Yes. But I can just imagine your reaction to that. You must have, I mean, like, I don't hang up, but you must have enjoyed it, I guess. No. See, that's, that's, that's what people think about males, that they necessarily will enjoy it. Oh, they must enjoy raping women sometimes. I mean, why, why would a man rape a woman? Well, I mean, because he's very sick. Well, yeah, but that's beside the point. All right. What do you mean that's beside the point? That's the reason. How's it beside the point? No, I'm saying like sometimes like in, in, in like I guess like this, uh, there could be like two instances of rape, like in the sense where he just gets violent, he just jumps any woman, you know, that he doesn't know. Then, of course, then you have the other case of rape where maybe uh, the guy could be going out with the girl or something, and he, forced, and he forces sex upon her, and he just has sex with her. Well, that's another case of rape, too. And, you know, the, the woman doesn't contest with her, she doesn't consent to it. You know, he could be dating a girl, and but the other kind of rape, that's when he just, you know, goes around raping everybody, and the people that he doesn't, that he doesn't know, the women that he don't know, that he doesn't know. But uh, then there's the other kind of rape where, uh, you know, he's going out with a girl, and he wants sex, she does, and then he just pushes himself upon her. Do you consider them both equally rape? Well, uh... Well, actually, the second one isn't rape in the sense of, of what you would think. Well, of would course be. it's rape. I mean, your, your, your attitude about what rape is and what rape isn't is, is really absurd. Why do you think so? Rape is having sex with someone who doesn't want to have sex with you. Well, actually, I mean, it's a milder form of rape, actually. The second There's no such thing as a... That's like being almost pregnant. 
no such thing. Well, I mean, but uh, it's still, uh, well, it's true, it's still rape, but it's not as a, how, uh, uh, like, it's still an offense, of course. It's still an act of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how, breaking those, the, what, the sex rules, I don't know, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, but, um, yeah, but the other version of rape, I mean, is, is just rape, and of course, you know, using violence and, uh, and there's something I don't understand about men. If they're going to rape a girl, what, 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 why do Are you the person that called me last night? No. Oh. No. But, uh... What's so called? Uh, like, if a man is going to rape a girl, why does he have to beat her? Why can't he just rape her and go, right? There are some rapists that don't beat the women. And then there's rapists that do, too. Yes, of course. But, uh, of course, we all know that a rapist is a sick individual. But would you rate a man that, uh, like I mentioned before about the second one, that, uh, you know, forced himself upon a girl that he's going out with, would you say he was sick, too? Or could it be he just got the urge and, uh, you know, couldn't hold back? Would you label him sick? I mean, he was out on the date. I would have to know the circumstances. Well, it's just a normal thing. He takes no, a girl out. No, there is no normal circumstance. And then he kisses her goodbye, and then he wants something before he takes. Uh, no, I'd have uh, to. I'd have to know the circumstances. I mean, she lead him on. Uh, well, let's say she didn't, no, and he just got in the mood. Well, he's being terribly improper and uh, should uh, should hold down his frustrations. Yeah, I think he's sick. Yeah. Oh, you you do so hmm. oh, um, because uh, rape is a very complicated thing. I mean, it's a shame how. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, how a girl can't even, uh... Actually, to me, in my opinion, I don't know what you think of this, but I think the man should always uh, have the, the contraceptives on him, you know? I mean, his own his own uh, condoms or whatever. Well, if that's how you feel, I really think the women should carry them around if that's what they want. Because most men assume that women today are in one form of birth control or another. You'd be surprised all the women that go out on dates and they don't carry anything. I mean, they don't wear anything or anything like that. Well... Majority of the times, the men always have them in their pockets. No. And also... And uh, we, uh, we have uh, three guys in the studio here. How many of you guys uh, <laughs> carry them with you? Nobody's carrying one with them. But then again, these guys never see any action. <laughs> Maybe they just don't date women. <laughs> well, thank you for calling. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, bye. Good morning. You're on the air. Uh, good morning. I'm calling concerning the uh, topic you were speaking about at the beginning of uh, yesterday, last night's show about you requesting a complete set of phone books mm -hmm. in order to uh, prevent the telephone company from making charging for the information. Well, I want to be able to have access to all the phone numbers in the state of New York so I don't have to get charged for asking for them because I obviously do not have a phone book, say, for Schenectady, and I do make calls to Schenectady upon occasion. Oh, I see. Well, and I would have to, I, I, I want those numbers. I mean, I, I don't want to have to be charged. 10 cents for a service that I can get for nothing, which is the phone books to look them up in. Right. Well, um, I read today in one of the papers a quote from uh, a New York telephone company spokesman because a lot of people were calling up, you know, requesting for the books. So I don't know if this applies for you or not. I'll, I'll just read it briefly. It says that uh, it would be a complete waste of money and resources to give them out to people who have no real use for them, and people will be charged. Um, let's see. Uh, they will be charged. They'll have to pay the uh, director assistance fee unless the total of information calls in an area reached, quote, sufficient levels of inquiry according to their records, and then they'll get the book for the area. So uh, I don't, they didn't list what uh, sufficient levels of inquiry would be, but that's the only Well, un unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, that has yet to be proven. I don't want to have to pay cent one for information, and that's why I'm requesting the books now. And the fact is that that's the phone company... They, they didn't say there that they could that they that they wouldn't give them to you. I mean that, that he's kind he's kind of hedging the bet there. Well, um, uh, from what I understand, yeah. legally they have to give you the phone books under the present set set of circumstances. Right. They cannot deny you a free phone information source. Okay. Uh, it says here, uh, Altman, a uh, man that requested them, his name is Altman, said that his request for 163 telephone directories for New York State has been refused. And um, that's what it said. I don't, you know, I don't know if, if, it's, if they could carry it further or not, but it has been refused. Well, if they refuse me, I think I, I might turn the whole thing over to my lawyers and let them handle it. I think that there's a real case to be made here, but I don't think that the telephone company should get away with being allowed to charge 10 cents for a service, which is essential to you using your telephone. Uh, that, yeah. You know, that would be much like, uh, what, what would be a good example? Uh, that would be like the uh, subway system charging you for, for uh, be like the Long Island Railroad charging you for a schedule. 
Yeah. I mean, how in the world are you going to be able to find out when the trains take off and go if you don't have a schedule, right? Yeah. Uh, it would be like uh, one of the cable systems not sending you a program or not letting you know what programs are on. Um, I mean, it's all very ridiculous. And the fact is that if you, you know, what are you supposed to do? Get a telephone and then never use it because you can never find out a number? That's right. I mean, you know, how do they expect you to uh, use your telephone and earn them, uh, get, give them their money, you know, unless you know the numbers? I would say one thing. Okay, and this would be enough if everybody were to do it, say, in the state of New York, or at least in New York City. Yeah. That, for instance, I live in Manhattan, so they send me a Manhattan telephone directory, and also the yellow pages. But I don't get the Bronx, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Westchester, Long Island. Yeah. And I think I would have a perfect right in asking for those. Yeah, the, yeah. The, and if everybody asked for those, it'd still drive them broke. You're right, and I think they would allow that because... Um, this one person said they agreed to send them a 14 or 15 based on their record. So I, you're right. I, I don't know. I think that would be a good idea, though, because I think it's ridiculous. I, I mean, I don't. People just don't call directory assistants to annoy the people. You know, for fun, they really need the numbers. And in, in the course of a day or a week, you you just call it. You know, you need you need to just pick up the phone. It's a convenient service. And, uh, you know, I don't, would you be charged in the phone booth, would you know? Or is that the Yeah, case? yeah, you sure would. That's, that's, that's horrible because, uh, you know, losing dollars, paying for that, especially in, I don't know, I just, you know. Well, I mean, I just, I think that especially from phone booths, it should be for nothing because most phone booths do not have telephone books. That's right, I was going to Or stop. if there is one, it's been so mutilated by the right. public. Right, yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, how is a person going to be able to find something out? I mean, I, I think that it's it's total, it's total a terrible thing that the phone company is doing. Their, their reasoning behind it, I'll go along with. Okay, their reasoning is most of the numbers people ask for are published numbers, and they could look them up in the book. Okay? Yeah. I'll be more than happy to. Give me the books of every county and borough and whatever in the city, state of New York, and I'll be happy to look it up every time. Right. You know, but unless that's the case, I mean, here's the way the phone company should do it, okay? okay? I live in Manhattan. I have a Manhattan telephone directory. If I phone up information in Manhattan, right, yeah. try to get a number, it costs me 10 cents. Uh -huh. But if I call up information to get a number in Queens, it doesn't cost me anything because I don't have that information readily available. Yeah, that's, that's right. You know, so, uh, I mean, that's the way they really should work it. I mean, if indeed that's their intent, but you know that isn't their intent at all. Their intent is to make a fortune off of it. Yeah, they're making a fortune on that. They even have a, now dial a joke and dial a... Right. Yes, by the way, folks, do not dial dial a joke. <laughs> There's a reason behind it. Do you realize that every time you dial dial a joke, the telephone company makes, uh, at the very least, I think 7.1 cents. And that's why they've installed those things, so you'll use your phone a lot. Yeah. And 7.1 cents, and for a thousand people a day, you know, it's a lot of money. They're probably more than that, though. Probably like about five, six thousand people a day call that number. Yeah. So, I mean, it's making the phone company a fortune. And there are, there are some, I think, some antitrust things going out now about that. Mm -hmm. Yelling and screaming that, that the phone company is using it as a ploy to be able to, you know, get more revenue by having people call these stupid phone numbers all the time. Definitely, yeah. And um, I read somewhere, Reese, I don't know where, but uh, they said that uh, push-button phones, uh, inadvertently people are making more calls. They just find it fun to dial little children. and they, Or when people mm. first get the phones, they just want to keep pushing the buttons, hearing the tones. Well, no, the, the point, of, in fact, is, and I will agree with that, is that uh, my phone bill, I would say, went up a third when I got a touch-tone phone. Yeah, so did mine, right. Yeah, because it's so much easier to dial a number. I mean, you, know, right. you think twice when you know you've got to roll your way through through seven digits, you know. Right. Um, I mean, I'm not a great... Um, I don't put down the phone company much on this program because I, I I honestly believe that of all the utilities we have going, they're the easiest to work with. It's true. Okay? Yeah. I mean, nobody has... has has uh, seen disaster and, and terror and 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 ulcers uh, like one will get dealing with Con Ed, for instance, which is the lousiest sleazo organization I've ever run into in my life. I mean, I, I, you call up there and it's like you're the dirt of the land. You know, yeah. uh, th those people could do uh, those people could do. Um, um, 
public relations for, for Nguyen Cao Ki. I mean, uh, they've got uh, they're just the most maddening people I've ever had anything to do with in my life. I'm on uh, Long Island and Loco is about the same way. Uh, they do work in the neighborhood. They don't tell you they turn off your gas. You have to have about five trucks come over, and uh, it's ridiculous. You well, my big fight was last month where uh, they sent me a bill saying that unless I paid the the rest of my bill, they would turn off my electricity. Mm. I didn't send it to them within three days. And the balance outstanding was five cents. <laughs> yeah. So I sent them a check for five cents. But, I mean, it... it you know, I mean, Con Ed, to me, uh, if nothing more, the city should slap the wrist of Con Ed for the way they treat the public. I mean, they're just not nice people in the way they treat the public. And... Um, but I've always felt the phone company was always quite reasonable as a phone company. Yes, they were. Although I had a dealing with them last week that was not particularly pleasant. Uh, it was very frustrating uh, because somebody had, had phoned the phone company as a practical joke and said that I was go uh, that, the, that they were me and that I was going on vacation and somebody's going to be staying at my apartment so would they turn off the phone and please don't turn it on in case the guy calls and says turn it on. Oh, boy. Yeah. So I call and I say turn on the phone and they say how do we know you're uh, you know you're Alex Bennett. <laughs> yeah. And I said you know I said why didn't you ask that guy who called originally to prove to him to you that he was Alex Bennett. You took his word for it without even questioning it. So this is a little a little uh, backwards, isn't it? Yeah. You know, they wanted me to come down and prove who I was, you know, Jim well, just come down with identification showing you're Alex Bennett. Well, I don't have identification saying I'm Alex Bennett. I have identification saying I'm Bennett Schwarzman. Crazy, yeah. Because they could just uh, ring your phone, right? And, you know, you'd pick it up and you'd be there. Oh, well, they said, yeah, but they, they said, according to that person, you're going to be staying at the house. Oh, well. Oh. You know. So, uh, I said, look, get out, you, you have the latest bill there? I said, I have the latest bill here. I'll start reading you any number or figure, backwards, forwards, or upside down that you want on that bill. And they still wouldn't do it. Finally, finally they, they, I, I just told them, look, you know, I mean, if you don't turn this on, it's going to be a lot of trouble. And we finally, they, they reluctantly turned my phone back on. And I, of course, that will never happen again because I told them uh, the only way that my phone will ever be turned off by me is if I come down to the phone company personally, show you my face and say, turn it off. And so that's permanently in the records. But the fact that they wouldn't, uh, you know, they would question anybody calling up, right? Yeah. Right. But then when I call up griping about it, I've got to fight and battle and, good, uh, and they want me to come down to the phone company and get my phone turned back on. It's just incredible. I, I don't know. Uh, the dealings I've had with them, they, they seem like they were a regiment that they all are very polite and they, uh, every, you know, very pleasant. But they, you have to call them hundreds of times, really, so many times to get through to these people, and they don't trust you. They don't. You have to tell them what bill and what record, and they, you know, they don't, they're reluctant to give out any sort of information when you, even when you have the proof. And well, you know how we find out how, how we finally proved it? Because I guess on my phone record there, there was my social security number. Oh. So she asked me, what's your social security number? And I said, blah, 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 blah. And like it was a quiz show, she said, you're absolutely right. We'll turn on your phone. <laughs> you know, I felt like I was, uh, you know, a winner on the big magic marble game or whatever. Yeah. But uh, I mean, it, it, but uh, uh, I just don't like what the phone company is doing now, you know, I, I th because I come from California where you could, you know, like you live in Los Angeles and the whole area is is a single dialing area. Yeah, two one three. Uh, no, 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 excuse me, Houston, Texas, for instance, single dialing area, the whole town, you know, yeah. uh, it's the same message you need to call one part of town as it is another. Oh, that's great. Here, if you if you phone twenty blocks away, that's you're right. in a two message unit area, you know, right. and I mean the phone company really uh, cleans up in this town. You never hear about them yelling about going broke. No, no feeling about it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wonder if enough people would do it, if uh, if it would work, or if they'd just be stuck. I think if people just requested the phone books right. for their area, I mean, that legitimately they would wind up using, okay? Yeah, right. I think the phone company would probably have to drop the 10 cent thing, because can you imagine if everybody in New York City who has a telephone asked for the, for the uh, say, five books they don't have now? Yeah, I, I just did that recently, yeah. Right. You know, what the expense to the phone company would be. How much those books cost them a piece? They've got to cost at least a buck to the phone company yeah. for each book you know five bucks a person you know after a while that's a lot of money you got 
10 million people in this town maybe have telephones or the 10 million telephones and the, the subscribers in this town no i really think that's the reason 10, 10 million times five yeah. 50 million books 50 million dollars in telephone books right they would come. that's going to be an awful lot of dimes to make up that deficit that's right uh, I, I really agree with that because um you know everybody is supposed to be so uh, money-minded these days and everything it would be they, they could not say that uh people are not uh, you know are unjustified for um you know, asking for the books. As you said, you know, everything's a message unit and uh, we only get one book. So I, I think that would, that may be a good idea. I don't know. Yeah, yeah well, I certainly think that probably all of us uh, from time to time use information, at least when calling other boroughs, because we don't have that book around. Right, right, yeah. And why should I be forced to have to use information in order to get a number and say Queens when I can have a book that gives me that? Uh, granted, I don't call Albany all that much or Schenectady all that much, but I certainly do call Queens and Long Island. I think the books I would be entitled to at this point would probably be uh, Manhattan, the uh, well, all five boroughs, plus Westchester and Nassau. You know, I mean, uh, without any gripe at all, because those are areas that I call all the time. Right. Yeah. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good morning, you're on WPLJ. Hey, yes, Alex, I want to say something about the woman that called before. I mean, don't you think, like, her ideas are rather ridiculous? That's what I said when she called. I mean, it seemed like she was saying the same things over and over again, and she was trying to get you to agree with her, and... I mean, she was talking about contraceptives like they were cigars for men or something, you know? Mm -hmm. The pocket, I mean, I thought she was a little ridiculous. But what I really called about is, have you been reading about the James Hoffa search? Yes, yes. So on the front page of this Sunday's news, it says they hired a hypnotist in it. Yeah, that was on, the, well, that was on our last newscast. Hmm. I mean, do you think that would be reliable information? Well, I mean, the, the only reason they hired the hypnotist is because these people uh, forgot who the Hoffa was supposed to meet, and so to conjure Good morning, you're on the air. Hello? Hello, Alex. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk to you about Beyond the Door. And uh, I just want to know your opinion on it. I haven't seen it. You haven't? Well, I just want to tell everyone out there that just save your money because it's the worst, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank I you. Think... Good morning, you're on the air. Hello? Yes. You know, I didn't know when I was really on the air. Like the last time, you, know, good, you know, good evening, you're on, or good morning, you're on the air. But I didn't say anything, so like an idiot, I say, you know, in my room, good, hello, and nothing happened. Yeah, well, anyway, what's on your mind? Well, I just wanted to ask you what you think about uh, education in the high schools these days. Do you think that uh, public high schools are giving the quality uh, education that people pay taxes for and always griping about? Well, um, no, of course not. Uh, there's never been a decent educational system in this country, public educational system in this country. It's abominable. Where'd you go to school? California. Did you find, uh, from what you've talked to people in New York State, that it's better, is any better in California? California is a very good educational system. New York State has a very good educational system in comparison to the rest of the country. It still stinks. Yeah, it I stinks like because the whole concept of education in this country stinks. It is not a question of teaching you anything. It's a question of indoctrinating you. It's a, que uh, it's a matter of giving, you, making, telling you that you're going to pass school if you give the proper answers. Many times those answers are not the proper answers. Those answers are the answers the society wants you to give. Yeah, I'm afraid to say, you know, I agree with you. In other words, what they're doing is you're a robot, right? Yeah. And they're programming you like a computer. Yeah, yeah. And if you spit back the information properly as it's been computed into you, then you pass. But if you somehow ask questions or spit back information that may be yet another answer that doesn't fit their idea of what you're supposed to believe, then you fail. Good question would be, for instance, uh, you, we had this one in school, who discovered America? What's right the, now, people would, uh, teachers, I think even when I was in seventh grade, quite a few years back, if I said the Vikings, they probably would agree with me, teachers are getting progressive. Right. No, wait, wait a moment. That, but that isn't progressive. See, if you said Columbus, they'd give you, they'd say, okay. If you said the Vikings, they'd say, creative kid, okay. They even did it when I was a kid. If you wrote down American Indian, uh, they'd say, wrong answer. But how can you possibly discover anything when there are already people here? They don't count. That's what uh, you're expected Ex to believe. Exactly. And that's what I mean by that, that, that 
the, it being you know being having information put into you if you respond back properly then you pass see so you're supposed to believe that Columbus or the Vikings discovered America but the fact is the American Indians discovered America when they came over the Bering Straits what you're being asked to absorb is white man's history, not uh, not uh, not not uh, human history. Now, what I wanted to talk to you about another thing, you know, to do with that uh, education in the high school. Do you feel if one teacher is really, really abominable? I don't mean you know physically, like the teacher is, uh, you know, you know, molesting the students or anything like that. But in the methods of teaching, so backwards and like you know, so crazy and so you know, playing favorites, you know, throughout the whole day, you know, every day for the whole year, year after year. Do you think a teacher like that should be lifted easily? Because I have one such teacher. I mean, I go on for about three hours of well, stories. Well, let me... School, I'm not going to tell you. But I'm just saying this teacher, you know, is still teaching it for six years, and they got tenure. It's like... Uh, you wouldn't, it's like so hard to get... Well, let, let me put it this way, you know, I mean, I work in the radio business and there are rotten radio announcers who keep working. Um, uh, I mean, it, the fact is that in any business you're going to have that happening and there's very little you can really do about it. I mean, uh, you're, you're, you're letting yourself up for human error. I mean, my, my big argument has always been, <laughs> and I, uh, Tim Leary told me this years ago, and it's one of the few things he said that really has stayed with me, and that was... Just think about it, you know. You take a kid, you raise him. When he reaches about six or seven years old, I can't remember what age you put him in now, you turn him over, and for eight hours of his day, he is being raised by a total stranger who you probably wouldn't even invite into your home to have dinner with. And I don't know if I, partic I, don't know if I particularly want to surrender any child that I would have. To, to this to to this educational system. Well, supposedly I mean, you're not qualified. I mean, you didn't go to college. I, I mean, you went to college, but you didn't no, study every. No, I'm not. I'm not qual. I'm not qualified to teach him. But I would like to be able to select my child's teacher because what I'm saying, in fact, is here. You take care of this kid for eight hours a day, and you raise this kid for eight hours a day, and you instill in him certain thoughts and ideas for eight hours a day. And I just like to know that my kid is uh, having good influences and not bad influences. And to me, what bad influences are, are establishmentarian people who will uh, will teach people how to good, be good little Nazis. Uh, and, and that's uh, uh, what this teacher is known as. Uh, that's uh, her nickname. You know, she's a Jew, but she's known as uh, you know, the neo-Nazi. Yeah. I mean, it, like, I mean, I hate to pick on one. I mean, I've had you know a couple of rotten teachers, but I really feel this teacher is you know quit, is not you know can't be standard. You can't be you know, by anybody in this. You're not anybody in the school. But I'd say about one quarter. And it's a big joke that when somebody says this teacher is rotten, you know, somebody it must be a rotten teacher because the term isn't standard. It's stood. Uh, uh, I knew you were going to correct. I don't mind. <laughs> No, it's not your fault. It's your teacher's fault. Yeah. Well, that was, that's another thing. Yeah. When you get, like, into a higher grade, even, like, ninth grade, the hell with grammar, now you're progressive. Like, I had an English course. It was an elective. I took it. I enjoyed it. It was called War and Peace. And, it was, you know, very, we didn't even read the book War and Peace. You weren't required to do that. Required to study, you know. It was originally a survey of, uh, you know, anti-war books. But then it, you know, materialized. You study books on war and books on, you know, foundations of peace and, you know, and sociology. And... I don't think we really talk too much about grammar or even spelling or vocabulary you know, or any of the uh, you know, classic English subjects. Mm -hmm. So by the time a person gets to you know, 11th, 12th grade and they have to take the SATs or they have to take, even worse, the uh, English achievement tests, forget it, they have uh, you know, already forgotten the things that were drummed into them in 7th grade. Well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way now because, uh, you know, sooner or later I'm going to wind up having a, a kid and... Uh, I'm um, I'm trying to look for a way now to uh, be able to at birth uh, hide my kid from the government. In other words, to have uh, my child privately delivered by a doctor who is a friend under private circumstances with no birth certificate recorded, so that the child can uh, go in this country. Uh, under assumed names and so on and so forth and not have to ever be registered in any way shape or form with the government because I don't like the idea right now uh, in Washington DC I gotta tell you this they have opened up a new service the uh, Office of Health Education and Welfare and now it has a computer that is linked into the IRS computers and the Social Security computers and so on and they can now track down runaway fathers 
to try and get them to pop for uh, support of the children. Now, that in itself is not a bad idea. I think any guy that runs out on his kids ought to be chased down a yeah. little bit, you know. But the fact is that it's a, there's a great danger in that because they can also track down just about anybody in the United States with this system. And now it's only being used for health, education, and welfare. But what's to say the FBI doesn't borrow the computers for a couple Probably of hours? Probably already have been. You know, that's, it's, you know, and I don't, I don't want my kid to be on any computer anywhere. You know, and I'm trying to think out, out a system whereby my kid will not exist. Literally, uh, so far as the government is concerned. It might concerned. be possible, but I doubt it, really. Now, Stuart, you know, you're talking to that guy about the phone. I was waiting for the nerve to pick up. You know, I have this thing in front of me from New York Telephone. They're playing gimmicks now. You see, if you don't call up information at all, you know, outside of, uh, you know, inside your own state, you'll get 30 cent credit on your, uh, your, your telephone bill, plus you have three free. And they say this will cover most people. I don't know. Do you think uh, you make... Uh, six or less, uh, you know, call them to uh, director assistance every month? Um, no, I make considerably more than that. Yeah, I would think, you know, I don't make too many, but I can think I'd make maybe 10 or 20 at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if it's by laziness. All right. Unless I've got to run. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Bye-bye. From our WPLJ Keeping Track file, there'll be a free rock folk concert taking place Saturday, August 16th, 2 p.m. at the gazebo, or at any gazebo, the Gazebo, Fort Tryon Park in Manhattan. When you have something for keeping track, send it WPLJ New York, New York, 10019. Good morning, you're on the air. Yes, good morning, Alex. Yeah. Um, as a radicalist, I didn't think I'd be defending the phone company or um, the educational system, but I'm going to do that tonight. All right. Um, first of all, one reason why you shouldn't call uh, dial a joke. Um, they're bad jokes. Right. That's that's the <laughs> you know, they're real. Henny Youngman and Jack Carter and uh, D David Brenner now. Mm -hmm. uh, they're getting a little more hip. Maybe. Uh, David Brenner isn't a hip comedian. Well, compared to Henny Youngman and Jack Carter, he is. <laughs> Maybe they'll even get uh, Colin out of obscurity and um, put him on. Uh, you know who the, pres the president uh, or the uh, chairman of Big Mac is? Who? William Ellinghouse. Hmm. who is the president of New York Telephone. Oh. Um, which is one reason why the city is going to get out of its fiscal crisis, because New York Telephone is one reason why the city is in its fiscal crisis. Why would you say that is? Well, why did I... Yeah, I assume you're being um, facetious with that remark. Why no. did I say that? No, why is New York... New York Telephone... If New York Telephone um, would give some of its profits to the city, um, the city wouldn't have a fiscal crisis. Now, does, it, does the city get uh, any percentage from the phone company? Uh, I know that with the cable systems, which, you've, you know, the TV cable systems, that uh, when the Board of Franchise uh, uh, let out, gave the franchises out, the requirement was, I have the figures at home somewhere, that no less than a certain amount, and there's an escalating scale for every year up through the year 2000, uh, no, no less than that amount, or 10%, whichever is more, of the profits of the cable company have to go to the city. I think the cable company is now under the present schedule, since they're probably not making a profit, pay something like $275,000 a year to the city for the right of having cable in the city. And I'm wondering if the phone company pays a, a certain percentage to the city for, for using you know, for, for having the franchise in New York City, or whether when they installed all those lines, that provision was never made. Well, I, I think they might give something to the city, but I think they should be forced to give a lot more. Uh, well, I think that corporations should be forced to give a lot more than they do. I mean, let the corporations bear the brunt for a change. They make money. Well, there's a, there's a big fight going on now between the, uh, the big landlords of New York City against the major oil companies. Yeah. Um, to raising fuel prices, uh -huh. which is interesting because it's uh, finally nice to see somebody fighting the oil companies that has as much power as the oil companies. Right. But um, the phone company is pretty uh, decent, that's true. Uh, in my experiences with them, because they, they are a communications company, so they have to sort of maintain a, a good communications image. Mm -hmm. um, they wish me a happy Easter. Um, I've joked about things with them. They're very fair. When you have a two-month bill outstanding, they're very fair, the deferred payment plans. Right. No, I'm, I look, I've always found the phone company 
fine people to work with when you've got to deal with them on a business level. I have no argument against that. I just think that this whole information thing that they're doing is a drag. And well, they, they sort of want you to pay your bill so they can continue service. See, Con Edison, when they send you your bill, uh, they, or your final notice, they really, deep at heart, don't want you to pay the bill so they can shut it off. Why do they want you to shut it off? Kind of basically is heartless, and they, <laughs> they sort of, you know, it's sort of like, hey, you know, come on, don't pay the bill because we really want to shut your electricity off so we can, you know, starve you and everything. The phone company sort of says, you know, why don't you pay the bill so, you know, you don't have to get your phone shut off and hassle us with it, but kind of deep inside, why don't you, you know, to shut your electricity off. I mean, the name Con Ed, you know, when I mail my bill to Con Ed, I put Con in very, very big letters, and Edison in very, very small letters. Um, the other thing is that they, now you have to pay for the postage stamp, and they, they don't take it if you don't put a stamp on it anymore. Yeah, well, that, no, that's, that's the postal department's doing that. See, I mean, like so many other people around, uh, when I used to mail out my bills every month, like Con Ed, for instance, I would never put a stamp on it. Let them pick up the, 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 the 10 cents on the other end, right? And uh, I guess they all kind of lobby, got together, and had the uh, postal department say that any letters that do not have postage on them will not be delivered, right? Yeah. Uh, and... Um, that's always griped me, too. I mean, why the phone company, why Con Ed, for all the money they get from us, can't put... I mean, I'd be willing to pay a dime a month extra on my bill if they would just have a self-addressed stamped envelope, okay? Because I get sick and tired of having to go down to a machine or whatever and get all the stamps I need to pay all my bills. Well, nobody mentions Brooklyn Union Gas, but they're up there, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooklyn Union Gas once came to my apartment. Is that called Bug? What? Bug? Brooklyn Union oh, yeah. Gas. I didn't thought of that, yes. Mm. Um, they came to my apartment at 11.30 at night mm -hmm. uh, to turn the gas on, uh, which, of course, is a, a decent hour. I don't know why I, I should have been surprised, you know. Everybody comes at 11.30 at night to turn the gas on. <laughs> you know, I, have, I saw a little note saying, sorry, you weren't at home, you know. But, uh, maybe I was sleeping, you know. <laughs> but, uh, sorry, we I see 11.30 p.m., and... Um, I couldn't believe that. The phone company is very on time, very, very, um, very prompt. If they say they're coming between 8 and 10, they'll come probably at 8. And, um, yeah, the phone company is always pretty good about that. Uh, they, they, they're installed with very nice people. To you see, them. we have to talk. Yeah, I, I mentioned the cable systems primarily because the cable systems are now another public utility, really, in New York City. And they, they're like the newer public utility. And, you you know, you would think that a newer public utility would... would work better than, say, the old public utilities because they would have benefited by all the mistakes and so on and so forth. But I've got to say that the cable system that I'm under, which is Manhattan Cable, their service has improved tremendously over the last two years. I mean, before you used to call for maintenance, and you were lucky if you could get it in a month. Mm -hmm. And now they're out there pretty promptly. Now they're out there in about three weeks. No, no, no. no. Now they're out there the next day between a certain time and a certain time. But the thing that gets me is why the phone company and the gas company and the cable companies and any other public utilities don't have people, you know, a night shift working from like six to midnight because so many people work. And if you want to, if you have something wrong with your phone, you got to go home and wait, take time off work, waiting for those people to come. And why don't they, you know, make sure they have people working like after six o'clock? Well, the phone company feels that you won't uh, suffer too much if you go a few hours without a phone. No, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having to, for instance, come home from work in, oh, in order to be there when the phone company arrives. That's happened to me. And, and, and why they can't schedule, say, you know, um, uh, things later at night and so on for people who, who just, you know, like suppose somebody lives in, lives in Queens and works in Manhattan. Yeah. Phone company says, we'll be out at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's the only time we can do it. Well, that means you got to schlep all the way from Manhattan out to Queens and then back again. Lose maybe um, a half a day's work, maybe a half a day's pay just to have your phone fixed. Well, when I was in California for the first time, I called from the payphone in San Francisco. Yeah. And I kept waiting for the operator to come on and interrupt me. Uh -huh. But um, I assume you have unlimited uh, time. Yep. Which is not true in New York, obviously. No. In New York, they'll charge you for walking down the street if they could find a way to do it. Uh, the other thing about education. Mm -hmm. um, teachers are human beings, too. I mean, I grew up hating teachers until my senior year of high school. And then I talked to them after class, and I got to know them as people. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're usually more intelligent than they come off to be in front of a class. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the problem is that most teachers have seniority, and all they have to do is come to the class, sit down, uh, put the assignment on the board, uh, and read the New York Times and the Daily News and wait for the bell to ring. Right. Uh, if they can change seniority, uh, that would be a big step. Right. But with um, Al Shanker as head of the teachers' union... You mean the man who got the bomb? Did you ever see Sleeper? Yeah. Woody Allen Sleeper, that great line in there about uh, what, what happened to civilization? You know, Woody Allen asked the, the people in the future, and they say, well, this man named Albert Shanker got the bomb. Yeah. I used to like Shanker, because I remember the Ocean Hill Brownsville thing in 69. All I know is a Shanker is a syphilitic sore. I'm sure he, he's... It is! Oh, that's right. I'm, yeah. Remember, remember, yes. you, now you remember hygiene one, right? Yeah. Don't, a Shanker is a syphilitic sore. So when I first heard the name Albert Shanker, I laughed my head off. But when I was like, I was 15 then, and... Um, Albert all, Shanker is a social disease. All I, all I cared about was not going to school, so when the teacher union went on strike in 69, yeah. I was all for Al Shanker. Actually, I'm not going to put Al Shanker down, because... I should call him Albert Shanker. He doesn't, I should call him Shanker. Mr. Oh. Shanker. No, he doesn't I'm not going to put him call. down only because um, when I was at uh, WMCA and I got fired, Albert Shanker sent a letter with a carbon copy to me to the radio station. Uh, arguing my dismissal, which I always thought. I, I think well, I still have the... Robert Shanker, deep inside, is a, is a publicity hound, because if he really wanted to do that much good for you, he didn't have to send you a carbon copy, but he wanted you to know. <laughs> I'm about to say, gee, thanks, Al. Hoping that someday, like tonight, I would tell the story, right? No, he was... Uh, no, I, I, I found that kind of interesting, because... Oh, one more thing. Um, have you heard about the new uh, radio station in town? There's no such thing as a new radio uh, station in town. Of, of, of the mellow sound in New York? The what? The mellow sound. The what sound? Mellow. M E W L O. Mellow. M E. Double L O. Mellow. Mellow. Mellow, yes. O W, you o -W. mean. What did I say? O E? Uh, it's mellow. Yeah, did you hear about it? The mellow sound in New York? Did I mention the station? Sure. No, WKTU. Oh, yeah. That. You've, heard of, you've heard of that? Yes. Uh, the disc jockeys have all the emotion of a, uh, you know, a wet piece of wood. Hmm. And um, it's really fun listening to them. They have all... Somebody wrote down here the catatonic <laughs> sound. <laughs> no, they have, they have all the rejects of the last 10 years in New York radio on that station. They have Murray the K. Yeah. Uh, Murray the K is on 6 to 10. And you know how it is to wake up and hear Murray the K with his, his voice. Oh, bang! No, he says, uh, you know what rock groups sell the most albums in the history of music? It's the Beatles. And that and 35 cents get you on the subway. <laughs> no, 50, starting September yeah. 1st. Uh, then they also have um, Johnny Michaels, who's probably the same when he was on CBS. Uh, John Vitiver. Um... And a couple of other, a couple of other rejects who, who made the KTU. Because anybody who has a decent voice could get on that station. Because all you have to do is say, you're listening to the mellow sound of Stereo 92 in New York, WK. No, don't give, don't give a station break, please. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to give a station break. Have you gotten any calls from uh, XLO listeners today, WXLO? Or have you gotten the normal show tonight? Uh, no, the no, we haven't gotten them uh, tonight yet. I guess I don't know. I mean, how do you tell an XLO listener? Except they're that, probably uh, very childish sounding, about 15 years old. Well, yeah, that's one way, and, and also they, say, they have they Alex? have they have more cavities. Is this Alex? So. Am I on the air? They'll say something like that. Well, it's hard to tell whether they are, are XLO listeners who just listen to any radio station as a general rule, you know. Hmm. Uh, this radio, for the most part, let's face it, has become rather mindless, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, it isn't even really vital, either. Uh, I mean, at one time, back around, uh, I think probably the most creative period in radio history was like back in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, with like the top 40 stations, with the personalities, you know, and all the contests and things like that. Because it was a, that was a period where people were really getting creative and trying to beat each other, you know. Now everything is so scientific. Everything's so computerized. I mean, they sit there with graphs looking at the uh, structure of the audience and how they can best, if we do A, uh, B will happen, you know. Well, you're, you're obviously familiar with uh, Rick Squar. Uh, I'm, I, I, yes, he, uh, he's just right across the hall yeah. here, yes. Uh, he has been uh, described by some people as the main uh, reason of uh, what is wrong with the radio. Um... 
I would say he was the prototype. Because he uh, always uh, depends on those charts. Well, no, I would say he was a prototype, only that, I mean, in my opinion, what's wrong with radio is just that it has become so computerized. Um, and and they're five, four very predictable. I mean, I'm not going to put down a Rick Sklar for coming up with it if he has no conscience about doing it. You know, if his conscience isn't bothered about having having changed the whole structure of radio for the worse rather than for the better. Uh, because, I mean, he, like anybody else, is out to make a buck, and uh, he was out to derive a format that will do well. Now, I could blame a guy like Sklar, or I could blame any one of a number of programming people in New York City who have created rather computerized formulas. However, I'm not going to blame them. I'm going to blame you. Okay, because obviously, when they do something and you react to it in a like fashion, then they're going to keep doing it. So what you've got on radio is exactly what you want, or let's put it this way: exactly what you. The, when I say you, I don't mean you in particular, I, but I I'm, that, yeah. but I'm saying the audience. You're getting what you deserve. Radio would do the weirdest, far out things in the world if they thought it would get them a big audience. See, I mean, because that's all they're concerned with. So I can't blame a Sklar, and I can't blame, blame a Bill Drake, and I can't blame all these people who are programming people for this, because what they did is they came out with a computerized formula, and that computerized formula was successful, and it was successful because people listened to it. And so the people who were to blame are the people who listened to it. Yeah, not, people you know. are gullible, you know, and... Uh if you keep hearing something after one one time after another, you get to believe it. Well, you know, I was told when I was told when I first went into this business that the mentality of the average listener was 12 years old, and I refuted that for years. But now I'm pretty well sold on the idea they were right. Yeah, yeah. that's true. So uh, it doesn't take much to convince the average radio right. person. So, but what I'm saying, what, I, what I'm saying is, is that. Uh, uh, if radio is is uh, is computerized and if radio is heavily formatted, it's not because of the people who run the stations. They're only doing what will get them an audience. If you're buying the act, then you're the one that's guilty of it. And so mo the people should never complain about what they get on radio and television because they're getting exactly what they've asked for. Uh, one yeah. more quick thing. Do you have any information about um, why uh, Ron Lundy was cut back? two hours a day. Was Ron Lundy cut back to two hours a day? Yeah. I mean, I didn't listen to WABC. I just happened to read it, and, they, and nobody has any information about why. He was cut back to 10 to 12. I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, no. it just happened a couple weeks ago, and nobody has any comments on it. I thought maybe you might hear something. No, no. Okay. Okay? Bye-bye. Yes. Take care. No, that's true, folks. I mean, you get on your radio what you want. I mean, broadcasting outfits are out to make money, and the way they make money is by getting audiences. And if they think they can, if they can get an audience by doing a certain thing, then they'll do it. If you don't react to it, if you don't buy the act, if you, the public, don't buy the routine, then the station won't do well, and it will then respond to whatever they feel you need is, or do something else until they finally find what your need is. And apparently in this day and age, what you, the audience, buy are heavily formatted radio stations that play a limited amount of songs over and over again in a very repetitive fashion. Um, that's not too different from the way radio was back in the, in, the, in the early 60s, late 50s. The only difference was in those days you had uh, a very heavy emphasis on radio personalities who uh, attempted very heavily to entertain and in fact were required to entertain. Tell you jokes, do voices, do comedy bits, contests, things like that. Um, but they found that perhaps you didn't like that either. You just wanted some anonymous voice. Uh, speaking between records and so uh, they did away with that and you responded to that and dug that so what, what you have on radio and the same thing is true of television I mean Marcus Welby wouldn't be on the air still if it wasn't a highly rated show and it's a highly rated show because people watch it and if people didn't watch it then it would be better so broadcasting is a very interesting uh, reflection and kind of a litmus paper of uh, of your mentality so uh, if you don't like what's on broadcasting stations, then what I suggest you do is improve your minds a little bit. Here's a uh, public service message from WPLJ. If you'd like information on how to adopt a child, call the Council on Adoptable Children. The number is 212-677-6830. Uh, Rick James with the news.
President Ford will be flying to Belgrade, Yugoslavia later this morning. The weather for New York, 81 degrees under fair skies. Look for very warm and humid conditions overnight with a low in the upper 70s. Sunny but hazy, hot and humid during the day with a high between 95 and 100. Partly sunny, hot and humid again Monday with a high in the 90s. I'm Rick James, WPLJ News. <laughs> That's a uh, new record by Paul Simon and Phoebe Snow, right? It's a good record. I like that. Uh, welcome back. I'm Alex Bennett. You are the ever impressionable radio audience. Uh, we're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. And I thank you for listening to me because that shows discernible good taste. And so far tonight we have been discussing... Uh, what are you guys giving those 10-pound looks for, man? What is that when I said that? Um, my, that was my father's sayings, was a 10-pound look. And this guy came over to me and gave me a 10-pound look. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yes, tonight we've been discussing, we've, we've been doing some discussion into public utilities and our gripes. I guess we all hate public utilities on one level or another. Uh, we all hate someone who has a certain power off over us to turn off the lights for instance or to cut off your communication because there goes your radio I mean there goes your telephone um, we hate people who we feel make us vulnerable to their whim and uh, I think the public utilities really represent that um, because they are our link. I mean, they are they they are they supply civilization. Is what they really do. They, um, you know, the electric company supplies you with civilization, as does the phone company. Um, and um, since you have a high feeling of of civilization in you, uh, you feel very frustrated with those people who, at, at a at a complete whim, can cut you off from civilization by turning off your phone, turning off your electricity, and throwing you back into the Stone Age. Even worse than the Stone Age, because at least back then you lived in your cave without electricity and without a telephone, but. You could leave that cave and go get your food and do all those kind of things, and it didn't matter. But now you live in a city. See, the big trap of the city is is that we need electricity or we'd all drop dead. 